Well, welcome. Wow. Okay, that's a strong microphone. It's a pleasure to be welcoming you to our first State of Democracy lecture for the year. I'm Grant Reher, director of the Campbell Public Affairs Institute, which is the institute that coordinates the series. Uh, first, on behalf of Syracuse University, I would like to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, the indigenous people on whose ancestral lands Syracuse University now stands. Now, I think for many of you, perhaps most, Ezra Levin needs no introduction, but before I offer a very brief one, I want to issue some heartfelt thanks. First of all, I want to thank all of you for coming. And I noticed when people were coming in, there are a lot of people from the community here. That's one of Campbell's goals, is to engage the community in many of our events. And so uh, that obviously worked this afternoon. I also want to thank the student groups who brought their members to this event. I want to thank the Dean's Office for supporting the series. For technical support, I want to thank the Information and Computing Technology Group, and in particular, Tom Fazio. And thanks as well, and as always, to Kelly Coleman and Sanju Rayback. They work in the Campbell Public Affairs Institute, and they help to put together uh, these events. And then finally, I want to thank my Campbell colleague, Professor Tom Keck, for originally suggesting Ezra as a speaker and for helping to bring some of you here today. So a few reminders, first of all, for all of us. Silence your smartphones. If you haven't already done that, please do that. Regarding our format, first we'll hear from Ezra, and then Professor Keck will engage Ezra in a conversation, and then we'll leave time at the end for your questions and brief comments. And when we get to the audience Q&A portion, I'd like to ask you to please wait for one of the two microphones that uh, we'll be passing throughout the audience so that you are part of our archive and also our live stream. Following the talk, we'll have a reception, which is back over in our home Maxwell turf, Eggers Hall, in the Strasser Commons area, where there will be refreshments and where we can continue the conversation that we begin here. I'll now end with a few words about our interviewer and about our speaker. First, my colleague Tom Keck, whom you'll hear from a bit later. He holds the Michael O. Sawyer Chair of Constitutional Law and Politics at the Maxwell School. His research focuses on constitutional courts and the use of legal strategies by movements on the left and the right. But he has also been a member of Indivisible, and he can draw on those experiences in his conversation with Ezra. And now for Ezra Levin. In 2016, when Donald Trump was elected president, almost every pundit and political scientist, at least the ones that I know, were surprised. I think gobsmacked is probably a more accurate description. A big chunk of the public celebrated. At least an equally big chunk objected. Some even mourned. Others simply shrugged their shoulders. But Ezra Levin went to work. Going to school in part on the earlier Tea Party movement, he and his spouse, joined by some colleagues, wrote a how-to manual for effectively organizing and leveraging the political process for progressive aims and to resist what they feared a Trump presidency would mean for policy and for politics. Now, normally the next line in such an introduction would be, and the rest is history. But in fact, the rest is now. Indivisible has played an obvious role in our political life. It has had tangible effects on electoral outcomes, both here in New York and elsewhere, and it's helped to change the face of and the faces in the Democratic Party. Yet there are now even bigger opportunities and challenges for it, which prompt equally big questions. How will the movement affect the impeachment process? How will it influence the 2020 elections? What role will it play as a new Democratic Party continues to take shape? And what needs to be done to advance small d Democratic aims? And is there room for Republicans in this movement and a new political landscape? I know that I'm keen to learn more about these things, and I'm delighted that Ezra is joining us this afternoon to share his thoughts and his experiences. So Ezra, welcome to Maxwell, and the floor is yours. Sorry. 
Hey, everybody, is this working? Yeah. Great. I never get a TED Talk mic like this, so it's really exciting. Um, I'm also, I'm really used to speaking at rallies in a t-shirt and with call and response. We have this book coming out in three weeks, so I'm probably going to just break into, when I say book, you say pre-order. <laughs> book. Pre We're going to work on that. That's great. Um, I, I want to talk about four things. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of background uh, about how I came to this work. Um, I want to talk about what we've seen from Indivisible over the past uh, three years. Uh, and then I am going to focus in on some of what we cover in this book that's coming out in a little bit, uh, specifically the threats to American democracy as we see it within the Indivisible movement and, and how we think it can be saved. Um, those four things, keep me to that. I, I'm not gonna cover everything. Uh, we intentionally have broken this up so that we'll have some discussion with Tom and then we'll open it up to questions from you all. I frankly think that the least interesting part of this is hearing me drone on, and I say that right before I drone on for a while. Um, but I wanna give y'all a time to poke and prod, understand what the movement has done, what we're thinking about. So first, just a little bit about my background. Uh, my start in politics was around uh, poverty advocacy. I started working on homelessness issues after college. Uh, um, I was working in the Bay Area. I, I came to the conclusion, though, that the problems we were facing there, the homelessness issues there, were, were huge and too big to be solved purely by local level decisions. So I, I thought, well, we got to go to the source of this. We got to change the decisions that are happening in Washington. And um, I, I went to Capitol Hill, worked for a member of Congress from Texas, a progressive, um, and started the week that Lehman Brothers uh, failed. Great timing. Um, and then Barack Obama came into office. And we had Obama, a supermajority in the Senate, and a, and a big majority in the House. And that both gave me an unrealistic expectation for what Congress can actually get done. Um, but it also exposed me to this different side of how power works in Washington, because at the time that Obama was coming into power, the Tea Party was rising up. And the Tea Party was ideologically on the other side of the spectrum for me. I didn't agree with their racism or their violence, but I saw the impact that the Tea Party had on the political system. Now, the Democrats passed the, the stimulus, they passed health care, they passed uh, Dodd-Frank, the financial reform bill. They passed big stuff, but they didn't get everything done that they wanted to get done. They didn't pass an immigration bill, they didn't pass a climate bill, they didn't pass a big union bill. There were other things that they wanted to get done that they couldn't, and that's because this group of people spread across the country wearing funny tri-cornered hats were showing up at congressional district offices and demanding that this president not actually get done what he was elected to get done. I saw the impact that it had there, and you know, frankly, after we lost the majority in 2010, I, I kind of thought of that as just this distasteful moment in American politics and nothing to particularly learn from that. I went off to study poverty policy in grad school, came back and uh, joined a think tank advocacy group to do more advocacy on poverty issues. And I did that for three or four years. And the conclusion that I came to by the time 2016 election was rolling around was that you know, the problems that were facing the issues I was focusing on were not ones that could be solved by one new white paper or another coalition meeting in DC focusing on a group of members of Congress to push. It wasn't that we didn't have the information in Washington, DC to solve these problems. This isn't rocket science. Other countries had done this. Other states had done this. The problem was we didn't have political will. And so I had actually decided to go off and do uh, a longer term poverty and democracy uh, research at, at Georgetown when uh, the whole sky fell out. Uh, and the 2016 election happened. Um, and, you know, as a former congressional staffer, uh, my wife and I, who both had worked on Capitol Hill, we really don't have very many applicable skills, right? Congressional staffers don't know how to do much, but we did know how Congress worked. And so as dark as that moment in 2016 was, there was this real bright silver lining, and it was really encouraging, which was people across the country, people who were distantly connected to us, friends and family members, were suddenly standing up and saying, oh my God, this is terrible, but what do I do? How can I be part of the solution now? And so we thought, look, we can, we can try to demystify how Congress works. We can try to say, this is where political power actually lies in democracy here. You can organize locally, you can focus in on your elected officials, and you can never give an inch. And the reason why we did that really 
came to a head a week or two after the election. And I remember it vividly. We were still going through the stages of grief, trying to figure out what to do, and there were two events within a 24-hour period of each other. The first was there was a, uh, an interview with a future Trump appointee, and he was referencing the Japanese internment camps during World War II as an example of what to do with the Muslim population. And it's similar to how they were talking about immigrants and refugees at the time, and continue to. That was terrifying in and of itself. But then the other thing that happened was an interview with the incoming minority leader, Chuck Schumer, on the Democratic side. Uh, in it, he talked about how, well, we lost the election. That's how it goes. We've got to figure out ways to cut deals. And maybe we can work on infrastructure with the other side. That's an option that we see forward. So looking ahead to 2019 or 2017, we saw this really terrifying potential future, one in which the, the roads to America's new internment camps were well paved. And that was a bipartisan agreement. That, that was terrifying. And so that's why we wrote this guide. We wrote this guide to say, no, in fact, you can do something else. You can say no. You don't have the House, the Senate, or the President say, we can't set the agenda, but we can actually influence what our elected officials want to get done. Um, so, <laughs> You know, like all political manifestos that a couple of people write uh, in their living room, we expected it would go viral and change our lives. Um, we didn't expect anything like that. I was eating soup at the kitchen table with Leah, I tweeted it out uh, to my dozens of followers, and thought that would be that. We thought that maybe sometime in the future, somebody would come to us and say, hey, we saw your guide and we went to a congressional town hall and we really gave it to our member of Congress. And that, that was gonna be success. That's what we were hoping would occur. Um, shockingly, what happened was the Google Doc crashed within a few minutes or a few hours of it being online. So many people were trying to access it. Uh, we got just thousands of emails, and they all said the exact same thing, which is, this guide is full of typos. Um, <laughs> and, and, and it was. So I mean, if you want something copy edited, just put it online. Um, if people read it, they'll, they'll tell you. Um, but no, then the second thing that everybody told us was, oh my god, I didn't know what to do, but now I've got 15 of my friends and we're indivisible Tallahassee, or we're indivisible East Tennessee, or we're indivisible Houston. Uh, within days, we had hundreds of indivisible groups all over the country. By January 2017, there were literally thousands, thousands of groups, locally led, organized under this banner of indivisible, and in every single congressional district in the country. So not just city centers, not just blue states, but in red states, in rural districts, there are these groups popping up of people who were starting to build power on their home turf. Uh, and that was terrifying because we had just tweeted out an indivisible guide uh, on Twitter. Um, and so we just brought as many friends and friends of friends into our living room to try to manage with all these questions that were suddenly coming to us. What do we do in our first meeting? What's happy in Congress? What about the Muslim ban that's coming through? Trying to respond, and eventually uh, that group of volunteers turned into a national organization. Uh, we have going on 90 full-time staff spread around the country who are working explicitly to build up the indivisible groups. We got one right in the audience right here, Sarah Rieske. Find her later to join your local indivisible group. Um, so these indivisible groups who started after the election, these are the folks who in part made up those masses of people who were showing up at congressional town halls in February of 2017. They're the ones holding die-ins uh, uh, to protest the repeal of the Affordable Care Act. They were showing up in partnership with local immigrant rights groups when Trump rescinded DACA. They're the ones fighting against the tax scam, which passed in 2017. These are the ones that then transitioned directly into registering voters, endorsing candidates, and getting out the vote to build the blue wave in 2018. That's what the indivisible groups have been doing for the last three years. And right now, in this post-election, post-2018 election period we're in, we knew that the indivisible movement had to evolve because the way social movements work, you either change with the times or you decline into irrelevance. So 2017 and 2018 was fully about more or less the, the indivisible guide, which was how do you build up resistance power when you do not have agenda setting power? That's not the uh, position we're in anymore. Because of taking the House of Representatives, because of the presidential <laughs> campaign, we know we've got to be proactively for saving American democracy. That's the next step. And that's not a decision that we've made. This is in consultation with the groups around the country. So this brings us to the, kind of zooming through this, this brings us to the next two parts of what I want to talk about, which are one, the threats to democracy as we see them, and two, what we're going to do about it. Um, we wrote this book 
because we wanted to build on the indivisible guide from 2016. We wanted to talk about not just how we build the power to replace Trump, although that's necessary, but also what we do with that power in 2021, what democracy we build when we get to a 2021 with a House, a Senate, and a president. Um, so let's talk about this historic threat to democracy that we feel we're facing, because any good how-to guide has to start with what are we up against? What is the problem we're actually trying to solve? And the problem we're trying to solve, the name is not Trump. Trump is a symptom. He is a grotesque, bile-spewing symptom. That's my opinion. Um, but, but a symptom nonetheless, a symptom of a much deeper problem. And the, the problem facing our democracy, we look at as two intersecting problems. One is the buckling of democracy, which I'll talk a little bit about. And two is democracy being rigged. So it's, being, it's buckling and it's being rigged. And I want to talk about both multi-decade long trends, uh, uh, one, one after the other. So buckling, what do I mean by buckling? Um, a political scientist at Yale named uh, Juan Jose Lenz, he published an essay a few decades ago called The Perils of Presidentialism. And he was talking about how poor the model of democracy is that relies on a presidential uh, system of government where you have a president elected and you have a Congress elected and they're in conflict with one another. They can actually bump up against each other. And what he says is this is a particularly weak form of democracy that it naturally leads to dysfunction, to brinksmanship, um, and that ultimately, when you look out over the scope of history, that countries that first started with democracy, starting with a presidential system, inevitably declined into just gridlock or straight out violent conflict. But there, there was one exception when he was writing this a few decades ago, and that one exception was the United States. Here was the United States with a presidential system that had been around at the time for more than a couple hundred years. Um, and yet it's still chugging along. Why is that? Why is it working still? And Lynn's had an answer to that too. He said that uh, American democracy uh, has these, these weird political parties. And he didn't say weird political parties, I'm not quoting. But he, he identified the fact that the political parties were different in America than other places. Yes, you've got Democrats and Republicans. You've got these two parties. But you've got conservative Democrats and you've got liberal Republicans. You've got conservative Democrats who are more conservative than the most liberal Republican at the time he was writing. And that's different. And it, and it allowed American democracy to continue chugging along. It allowed it to not break down into gridlock because they'd cut deals and they'd figure out how to move the country along. Um, Linz was obviously writing before Donald Trump, but he was writing also before Mitch McConnell was Senate Majority Leader. He was writing before Newt Gingrich had led the Republican Revolution. Um, and politics was changing at the time he was writing, and it has changed now. By the time Donald Trump became president, the most conservative Democrat was still more progressive than the most progressive Republican. That remains to be the case. Um, so the, these, these parties have become uh, ideologically distinct in a way they have not been before. They've actually um, become polarized. So that thing that we used to have that kept American democracy from breaking down into gridlock and dysfunction, we don't have that anymore. We've got polarized parties. Um, that's what I mean by democracy is buckling. But, but this is also where I get off the bus too, because a lot of people who are talking about this basic uh, analysis that, oh, couldn't we just go back to the time when American democracy wasn't defined by polarized parties? They're, they're, um, they're trying to make America great again, often. Um, and if I were in the audience, I would be thinking, oh, great, yet another white guy in a blazer talking about this bygone era. Um, so yes, we believe and we see democracy is buckling, and it's common to talk about these problems as, oh, both sides just need to come together and figure it out. But that's why the, this rigged portion of the analysis is so important, because at the same time the parties were becoming polarized, we see the Republican Party falling off an ideological cliff. And falling off is probably the wrong word. It's actually they've been being shoved off. Um, the Republican Party has become downright hostile. It's become reactionary. It's hostile to 20th century social and economic reforms writ large. And, and I don't use that phrase lightly. I don't say that they're just hostile to 20th century reforms as a, a throwaway line. I don't think that's hyperbole. Uh, you can't talk about the rise of the modern Republican Party without talking about the Koch brothers and others who helped drive it in the direction that it's been driven. I recommend Jane Mayer's Dark Money book on this. Nancy McLean has a good book, uh, Democracy Unchained. Uh, one of the jaw-dropping stories that I read in, in those 
books was on a, a rare moment when we actually got a peek inside what the Koch brothers and the rest of the reactionary conservative forces who are driving the Republican Party now is actually, are actually attempting to do. And it's when David Koch was running for president in 1980. He ran for president, uh, uh, he ran for vice president on the libertarian ticket. And folks, let me just read some of the proposals in, the, in that agenda that he was running on. He was calling for eliminating Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, just getting started, uh, for abolishing the FBI, CIA, FEC, FDA, EPA, and the Postal Service, uh, eliminating all campaign finance laws, eliminating child labor laws and the minimum wage, eliminating all individual and corporate income taxes. That was the proposal. Now, now Coke got 1% of the vote, he got creamed, he didn't come close. Um, but that was the agenda they were working on. So it's not enough to just call that an extreme agenda. They are not just trying to roll back what Barack Obama accomplished. They're not just trying to roll back Johnson's Great Society. They're not just trying to roll back FDR's New Deal. We're talking about rolling back the progressive era reforms of Teddy Roosevelt and, uh, and Wilson. Uh, this is trying to usher in a new gilded age of laissez-faire government where the robber barons just control things permanently. Um, so what does this have to do with democracy? Yes, that is a radical social and economic policy agenda, but so what? What does that mean for why is democracy being rigged? Um, and the answer is that these reactionaries aren't dumb. They look at the same demographic statistics and trends that we do. They understand that the country is getting more diverse and more unequal. That's not rocket science, the data's out there. They know in 1960, non-Hispanic whites made up 85% of the population today they make up about 60%, and that population is dropping. Uh, in 1960, there were fewer than 10 million immigrants in America. Uh, today, there are more than 45 million immigrants, and that's rising. In 1960, America's richest 1% took home 10% uh, of the income and owned 30% of the wealth. Today, it's 20% of the income and 40% of the wealth. It's pretty obvious to see what's happening. The country is changing, in my mind, for the better in many ways, but conservative leaders understand that if you maintain your allegiance to this radical agenda, what are you gonna do? You've gotta face the voters at some point. You've gotta ask them for their votes at some point. So you've got a choice. You can either moderate your agenda or you can choose to systematically disenfranchise people. You can choose to systematically make democracy less responsive to the will of the people. Which one have they chosen? The same year, that David Koch was running for president, Paul Ryrick was giving a speech to uh, a group of conservative allies. I don't know if y'all know Paul Ryrick. He is a real architect of the modern Republican Party as well. Helped co-found the Heritage Foundation. Um, he also, Heritage Foundation received millions from the Koch brothers. Um, he was giving a speech to these conservative allies and he said, and I quote, I don't want everybody to vote. As a matter of fact, our leverage in the elections, quite candidly, goes up as the voting populace goes down. I don't want everybody to vote. That is the foundation of this political strategy coming out of this modern reactionary party. What does that lead to? It means that you rig the maps. So in your next election, your candidates run in safe districts. It means you disenfranchise voters of color. You stack the courts with judges who will back you and strike down your opponent's policies. You roll back campaign finance laws so your friends have free reign. You cut their taxes so they have even more money to play with. You attack your opponent's power bases. You attack organized labor, communities of color, immigrants, advocate, uh, immigrant advocates and women. You amp up your own voting, voting base by talking about the other, by talking about the black and brown people or the immigrants or the refugees or the LBGTQ populations. You undermine faith in media directly this is the foundation. This is what we're up against. This is what we mean when we say democracy is being rigged, that it's not just buckling on its own, but there's somebody actively rigging it to entrench their power. That same speech that Paul Weyrich gave decades ago could have been given today. We see Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader of the U.S. Senate, standing on the floor of the Senate a few months ago, calling voting rights, D.C. statehood and election security, socialism and a power grab. He's not an idiot. He knows what he's doing. He understands that the single greatest threat to the agenda he wants to pass is a truly representative democracy. That's why he systematically dismantles American democracy to rig it in his favor. So yes, American democracy is being rigged. Trump is benefiting, it, benefiting from it. Trump is pushing this forward, but he did not invent it. 
These elite reactionaries have been playing this game for a very long time, and they've been playing it very effectively. It's all very scary stuff. It's not even Halloween yet. Um, so what, what are we going to do about this? Democracy is buckling. Democracy is being rigged. We're up against a lot. The book, the book, pre-ordered, yeah. <laughs> I'm, gonna get, I'm gonna get this, y'all. Um, uh, so the book is about these basic problems facing American democracy, but it, it's also about what we're going to build, right? We're not just fighting against something, we're trying to do something to make democracy more representative. And from our point of view, the stakes really have never been higher. And I know people say that about every election, but we see one limited window of opportunity to make this right. Yes, this depends on winning in 2020. There is no path to a representative democracy that does not involve having a Senate, having a president, and having a House that is willing to make reforms to our democracy. That is necessary, but that's not enough. November 3rd, 2020, in our mind, is a, a milestone, a very important milestone, but just a milestone. The real victory is going to be when we have that trifecta, we actually make the reforms we need to make. So I want to talk, I'm going to talk quickly uh, about six reforms that we cover. I know, six, and you've got to listen to the whole thing, but I'll go quickly to six reforms that we cover. Um, and if y'all are interested in any particular one, we can dive into that, into the discussion. Um, First is, there is going to be no pro-democracy legislation that passes in 2021 as long as the filibuster exists. The filibuster gives a minority in the Senate the power to veto all legislation, and it's not only the power to do so, we know that Mitch McConnell will use it in 2021, and I know that because he says it. He is proudly calling himself the grim reaper of progressive legislation right now. That's, that's his word, that's not mine. He calls himself the grim reaper. If he has the ability to, he will veto everything else I'm about to talk about. We know that already because he's promised it. So after you eliminate the filibuster, what can you get done? That's, that's the rest of the focus of the book. Because yes, there are a lot of constitutional amendments I would like to see get passed. None of them are going to happen in 2021. What we need to focus on is what can legislatively pass through the House, through the Senate, and be signed into law by the President. And it turns out there's a whole bunch that can be done. We can admit new states. DC should have statehood. Puerto Rico should have the right to self-determination, as should the other territories. We can do that. It's absurd that we haven't yet. On the House, we can ensure that people actually live in competitive districts. 90% of Americans don't live in competitive districts. We can change the rules to encourage these districts be drawn in ways that actually invite people to vote for who they believe in, instead of just having to tick whoever is the most likely candidate to win. In the courts, we know that Republicans have been waging a, uh, a battle to pack the courts for decades now. The last 15 of the, la 15 of the last 19 Supreme Court justices were appointed by Republicans. Donald Trump appointed more appeals court judges than Barack Obama and, uh, and Clinton did in their first two years combined. The courts have been packed. That's both swung the ideology in their direction and it's undermined the legitimacy of the courts. We need to pass legislation to fix that, otherwise, all of the reforms we're talking about here could be struck down. We need to vastly expand voting rights. There are more than 20 million immigrants who don't have the right to vote in this country. There are uh, around 6 million uh, formerly incarcerated or incarcerated Americans who don't have the right to vote. There are around 8 million 16 and 17 year olds who don't have the right to vote. You could expand the right to vote by more than 30 million. And we need to democratize the media. Uh, local media is dying in this country. It's dying, and part of that is nefarious, part of that is Facebook and Google and multinational corporations who are squeezing the life out, out of American media, but part of that is that the model just died. We have the internet now. We don't need classifieds as much. It's hard to sustain that business model. We haven't had a major investment in independent media in this country since the Corporation for Public Broadcasting was created 50 years ago. We need another one. A functioning democracy depends on an informed electorate. So, that's brief. We can go into any of these in greater detail. We wrote a quite, quite a bit of these in the book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so at the heart of all, so that's all I'm going to say on the reform specifically, but at the heart of all of these reforms is this basic foundational belief that the only legitimate source of power in this democracy, but actually anywhere on the planet, the only legitimate source of political power comes from the people. And in a representative democracy like the one we've got, We've chosen to parcel out this power. We call those parcels congressional districts or states. 
And we've decided to let individuals borrow some of that power from time to time. We call that a term of office. Every once in a while, they've got to go back to the people who are the legitimate source of power, remember. They've got to ask to borrow that power for a little bit longer. We call that an election. The reason why we're facing the problems we're facing right now is because there are breaks in that chain. Popular legislation doesn't even get a vote. Unpopular legislation that benefits corporations and billionaires sails through. <laughs> Representative democracy in America is not representative any longer. And if we want it to be, we've got to actually make the reforms. From Indivisible's point of view, this crisis in American democracy can be solved by adding democracy. We need to make our representative institutions more representative. And look, I believe that's possible. I believe it's possible because when, when I think about 2021, I think about the State of the Union that that new president is going to give and she's going to be looking out, or he conceivably, over this new Congress, they will have been elected by this changing grassroots movement that started as a resistance movement to Trump and is transforming itself into a pro-democracy movement, a movement that is not just going to declare victory on November 3rd of 2020. It's a movement that's gonna show up on January 20th of 2021 and say, great, we just got you into power, now how are you gonna use it? So with that, I wanna dive into anything that Tom wants to dive into. But um, welcome any of your questions. Please poke and prod. Welcome questions from any side of the ideological spectrum. Indivisible is not an arm of the Democratic Party affirmatively. We think that the only way this movement will succeed in transforming American democracy is if we grow it from now until 2021. And that means bringing on people who have been part of this movement, people who have never been part of any movement, and people who have been on the sidelines but want to get in it. Um, so welcome the discussion. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Ezra. And so just to, uh, to remind you of the format, so I'm going to get the conversation started with a few questions for Ezra here, um, and, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, and as Grant mentioned in his introduction, so I, I'm Tom Keck uh, from the Political Science Department at Maxwell. And I, as Grant mentioned, I have two um, sort of relevant bases of experience to draw on here. By day, I'm a political science professor. Um, and by night, I'm a member of a local indivisible group. So if anybody wants to hear m more about that, I'm happy to chat with you at the reception. Um, but at, at least for the beginning of our conversation, I want to start off talking to you as a political scientist and yeah. pick up on a couple of the things uh, um, uh, that you touched on in your talk and just sort of, sort of push that a little further. Um, and so I wanted to start with the concept of democratic erosion, right? Yeah. So, so you use the word buckling uh, um, in your talk, but, but a lot of political scientists have used the term democratic erosion. And it's a concept that political scientists who study um, uh, European and Latin American democracies have written about for some time. Uh, post-2016, the rest of us are trying to catch up. Um, and um, so in short, the concept is right that um, sometimes what looks like a stable, well-functioning democracy, the quality of democratic norms and institutions um, slowly deteriorates, right? We don't have, it turns out that um, sharp, sudden collapses of democracies are less common than they used to be, right? We don't have military coups around the world as often as we used to, um, but, uh, but it appears to be the case knock that slow, knock on wood, yes. It appears to be the case that slow, steady declines in the quality of democracies uh, is more common than yeah. it used to be. So, so just, can you just, so you touched on this a little bit, but, but your take on, on that concept as it applies to the contemporary United States, and so, then I'll follow up. Yeah, I mean, I actually, I would be inclined to put that more in the rigged category than the buckling category, yeah. because I think there is an active attempt to yeah. degrade democracy in the country, and it's not, it's not just because people dislike democracy, it's because they recognize their ideas can't win in a democratic system. So it makes sense if your goal is to abolish child labor laws, or your goal is to abolish all, all tax bills, or your goal is to provide tax cuts to billionaires and corporations, um, you, you can't do that if you've got a democratic system that will actually hold you in check. You'll, you'll either fail to get it through Congress or you'll fail to win election, uh, re-election. So I, I see the other side actively dismantling um, in order to achieve their policy goals. Okay, and so I think that's consistent with some of what we see in other democracies around the world as well, right? So countries like Hungary, Poland, uh, Venezuela, the Philippines, Turkey, Russia, um, are led by leaders who were democratically elected, right? Is a, it's, were their democracies perfect? Probably not, but they had a functioning democracy and they were democratically elected. And then once in power, those leaders tried to dismantle some of the norms and institutions of democracy in order, presumably, to 
lengthen their own control on, on, on power. And so I guess part of the question, so, so one question, which we'll get to in a second, is what do we do about it? But I guess part, the initial question is sort of the diagnosis, like yeah. how, like, at, so some things in US democracy have gotten worse in recent years, but sort of how far down that path are we? Like how big is the problem? So I think the, the problem is enormous. Um, the one statistic that I, I can't get out of my head um, is the trends with uh, the representation in the US Senate. So what, what we know is that uh, American populations are on their own, actually, just constant, well, to some extent, but on their own, concentrating in a handful of states. So in 20 years, 50% of the population is gonna live in 18, uh, eight states, be represented by 16 senators. Um, the other 50% is gonna be represented by 84 senators. When you look about at how this breaks down by uh, rural versus urban, by conservative versus progressive, it's not a pretty picture. What we know is 70% of the population is gonna reside in just about 15 states, whereas the more conservative, more white, more rural, 30% of the population is gonna reside in the rest. They're gonna have 70 senators. So uh, we have a shot to take the Senate in 2020. I think that is realistic. I don't think it's automatic, but there, there is a possibility there. But I don't see another shot after that. So when we look at, will we be able to pass democracy reform sometime in the future? This isn't a five-year plan. This isn't a 10-year or 20-year plan. This is a 2021 plan. That's our shot to actually take back power and pass these laws to reform democracy, make it more responsive, because after that, you're looking at near permanent control of the Senate and by connection the courts by either a Mitch McConnell or a Mitch McConnell lookalike uh, who understands that if you make these reforms, you're not gonna get your policy agenda done, so you're not gonna make the reforms. So, so there's some built-in um, structural weaknesses in our constitutional democracy, right? Equal representation of states in the Senate has been there from the beginning. Yep. Um, and some combination of shifting demogra demographic trends, which are making those built-in structural features worse or more problematic, combined with some systematic efforts by some people in power to undermine the quality of democracy, to preserve their own hold on power, right? So, okay, so that's the diagnosis. That that's sounds, the diagnosis. That sounds pretty bad. Um, <laughs> And so, um, so among political scientists, right, some of the conversation that's been going on over the past couple of years, right, so there's a book I'm sure some people are familiar with, it's called How Democracies Die. Um, yep. Two political scientists at Harvard um, came out shortly after Trump's election. Um, uh, one of the authors is an expert on European politics, the other is an expert on Latin American politics. They've both studied many democratic countries that have collapsed, um, and they try to draw on that experience in, in sort of illuminating the current US situation. And so among political scientists, a lot of the discussion about that book is focused on like, well, what do we do about it, yeah. right? And if, and, and uh, well, you're, so you're familiar with the book, so, so I'll, we, I'll let yeah. you jump in. So we, yeah, we yeah. read the book, I, and when it, when it came out, um, I thought it, it was both, um, both, both scary and instructive, um, but the least satisfying part of it was what to do about it in our current context. So we actually talk about that book in, in our book, which of course everybody's pre-ordering. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but so the, the analysis they give or the, the recommendation they give is that, well, you've got to um, build a bipartisan uh, movement in order to push both parties to come together around pro-democracy reforms, essentially. What it doesn't really conceive of is how to deal with a political situation where one party has totally fallen off an ideological cliff and is willing to both take hostages and execute hostages. And so the question is, so what do you do when the Republican Party is, for instance, standing on the floor of the Senate and actively blocking a vote on election security? What do you do when one party is actively undermining the freedom of the press? What do you do when one party is actively weakening incoming governors as they get popularly elected so that they can protect their agenda? Um, that's the situation we're facing right now. So I only have a partial answer to that, and it does build off what they say, which is you need, what you need is not one party coming in and playing tit for tat, because that leads to this death spiral where democracy just disintegrates. You, you need these reforms to come from someplace else. And it's one of the reasons why it's really important to us that Indivisible is not seen as an arm of the Democratic Party. Our goal is not to empower Democratic politicians. It's not what we do. What we're trying to do is build American democracy and make it representative. Now, currently, there is one party that is pretty affirmatively against that, at least at the national and, and state level to some extent. <laughs> um, but, but we are fighting for this with whoever will be part of this fight. So there are independents, there are former Republicans and even current Republicans, and there are Democrats who are part of this coalition who are fighting for this. I think that's necessary. Um, it is important that when we get into power in 2021, we're actually pushing those people in power to do the right thing, whether they're Democrats or Republicans. 
And so just to pick up on that for a second, so, um, so it, the current news, right, um, if you're following the impeachment uh, uh, scandal with new, new, new news every day, um, so there, there are a number of prominent Republicans, Republican lawyers, for example, and some Republican pundits, um, George Will this week, right, who've come out in support of the impeachment inquiry, right, George Will said no Republican uh, who supports Donald Trump um, should be reelected. Um, uh, and but so so there are people from across the political spectrum standing up in defense of dem small d democratic norms, yeah. but not in Congress really, right? And so what in Congress you it really is yeah. capital D Democrats, right? Who you're working with is that well? So yeah, I mean what we've seen there are a handful of elected officials who have come out to be critical of Trump or in favor of impeachment proceedings. Uh, I believe zero of them are running for re-election. Um, that's mm -hmm. the problem. There, there's a lot of political cowardice within the Republican Party right now. I think uh, we can impeach Donald Trump without any Republican votes. You can't convict him without Republican votes. Uh, and I think one of the things I think about, I, I'm from, um, from Texas, grew up in the boonies, uh, and there are a lot of megachurches in the South. Um, uh, and the story I think about is the megachurches saving the parking spots at the front for people who have never been there before. I think that's the approach we need to have to this. There are gonna be people who were never with us before, who aren't with us on a lot of things, but they're willing to come to us for this, and we need to be as welcoming as possible to them. So I don't know who the first elected Republican in Congress who is running for re-election is gonna be, who comes out uh, to actually stand up for the Constitution, um, but whoever that person is, we need to cheer them all along the way. This is what we did when we were fighting the health care bill. This is what we did when we were fighting the tax bill. Um, it's got to be a situation where it's not just us trying to whack the other side for being with Trump. We need to be as welcoming as possible when they're willing to come over. Right. So the story in How Democracies Die, the kind of story that they, they often point to is, right, so the Watergate impeachment, where you have uh, Barry Goldwater, conservative Republican senator from Arizona, um, come over to the Oval Office with a couple yes. of colleagues. And Nixon asks him, how many votes do I have in the Senate? And Goldwater says, 10, maybe. Yeah. And then Nixon resigns. Yeah, and before that, I mean, but, but even before that event happened in, in uh, 1974, you had um, Larry Hogan Sr., who was a GOP member of the House, coming out in favor of impeachment proceedings after being a Nixon supporter, one of Nixon's strongest supporters. Uh, the news over the last 24 hours is his son just came out for impeachment uh, proceedings. The Repu That's, Republican governor a, of Maryland. The Republican governor of Maryland. Yeah. Now, the messy history of that is that his dad was trying to run for governor and <laughs> so thought that it would probably help him and it ended up losing the Republican primary to an opponent who was a Nixon supporter. Um, not great. And also Larry Hogan uh, Jr. is not running for re-election. He's term limited out, so he doesn't meet that criteria. What the, the thing we really need are Republicans in Congress who are looking to face the voters and are still willing to stand up. And currently we have zero of that. Um, okay, so let me um, let me pick up. You, were, you went pretty quickly through six ideas uh, okay, of yeah. things things that need to be fixed, um, and, and let me pick up on uh, I think maybe two of them. Yeah. Um, and um, the audience might have questions about some of the others. Um, so so let me start with the Senate filibuster. Yeah. Um, so if I were to play devil's advocate, please, it might seem kind of scary to get rid of the Senate filibuster. Um, no party is going to have a majority all of the time. Yep. Um, and is that not a longstanding institution of our constitutional democracy that serves some important functions in protecting the rights of the minority? Great devil's advocating. <laughs> um, so I, I think, um, let me, I, maybe there are three things I want to say. One, uh, I think the legislative filibuster is dead. We just don't know it yet. As soon as Mitch McConnell sees it as a barrier to getting something done that he wants to get done, as soon as there is a Republican trifecta again, and this is standing in the way of, of some legislative agenda, um, they, they will scrap it. And the evidence I have for that is they've already done that a couple of times uh, since Trump became president. They scrapped the filibuster for Supreme Court justices, and then they weakened the filibuster further to expedite their nomination process. So they have shown no allegiance to the filibuster. They are willing to change the rules when necessary. They tried to repeal the Affordable Care Act uh, through budget reconciliation, which circumvents the filibuster, couldn't get 50 votes for it. They passed their single legislative accomplishment the tax bill through reconciliation, again, circumventing the filibuster. The reason why the filibuster technically is alive still is only because they haven't had to kill it. So the, the filibuster is already gone. It's just a question of whether it constrains progressive legislation in 2021. Um, but the, and, and that's the real question here. So we've got to imagine that we are in this 
um, this beautiful new 2021 world we're imagining where we have the House, the Senate, and the presidency. We've done this amazing work building up the political power necessary to realize that new political environment. And then the question in front of us is going to be, do we maintain this Senate procedural loophole or do we pass legislation? And keep in mind, the filibuster is not in the Constitution. The filibuster was not envisioned by the founders. The filibuster was accidentally created by Aaron Burr, as if you need another reason to hate Aaron Burr. Um, he thought we didn't need some provision. We scrapped it. They eliminated it. The filibuster was not used for decades. And then when it was used, it was used explicitly, explicitly by Southern segregationists to block civil rights legislation for three quarters of a century. There's nothing special about the filibuster. It is absurd to build uh, a system of representative democracy where 11% of the population can block popular legislation. That's what we've got right now because the filibuster exists. So I think it, it's not a question of um, like, should we pass the filibuster or not? It's a question of do we want social and economic reforms in 2021 or don't we? We're, we're discussing in the Democratic primary debates a lot of questions about climate or about health care or about gun violence prevention or abortion rights or taxes or immigration, all things that all of us care a whole bunch about. None of it's going to happen as long as the filibuster exists. So that's the question in front of us, and it should be a no-brainer for us. That doesn't mean it's not scary. It doesn't mean it's not scary. I think absolutely when the other side gets in power, they are going to do things that I don't like. And as a progressive, I put my faith in the will of the people, and I say, if you change election rules so that people have to be fairly elected and elections can't be stolen, if you make the country more representative so you enfranchise millions of people more, and in that new political environment, if there is a conservative trifecta that wins fairly and they want to do bad stuff, y'all, that's democracy. That's how it works. So, so the other one I wanted to pick up on um, was the courts. Yeah. Um, so as some of you know in the room, um, this is what I uh, write and teach about and have been for a long time, so it's going to be hard not to make this a 15-minute question. Um, uh, but let me see what I can do. So, um, so, so I wrote a book uh, in 2014 um, where I argued um, that the concept of judicial activism is somewhat overplayed. You hear a lot of complaints about the court using the language of judicial activism. It's overplayed, and instead the problem we should be focused on is partisan capture of the courts. Yeah. Um, that it's not that big a deal if courts are regularly intervening in policy and political conflicts because that's a long-standing feature of our constitutional democracy that the American people are mostly pretty supportive of. But it is a big deal if the courts are only doing that in the pursuit of one political party's agenda. Um, and when I wrote that in 2014, at the time, I actually thought we had dodged the bullet because Obama had just been reelected and he was in the midst of bringing the federal courts back into rough partisan balance, yeah. right? Now, yeah. not so much. Um, and so, um, so I agree with you that there is a significant potential small d democratic defect here where the courts are um, already or at least on the verge of being pretty far out of line with the views of the American public. So what do you do? What do you do? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think there are, are two problems facing uh, the courts. Um, and I mentioned a little bit, I think, one is the ideological swing. So the, the obviously, like, when we talk about court packing, we're often talking about mid-30s, FDR's overreach, and oh, what a disaster that was that he uh, tried to increase the size of the court. In reality, conservative court packing has happened, is happening, we're in it. The courts have been packed. Like I said, 15 of the last 19 Supreme Court justices are Republican appointees, and they're, they're jamming through a ton of appointees at the appeals court level. So the, the courts have been packed. The ideological swing has happened. It's going to be very hard to dig out of that. Because of what we discussed with the Senate and that natural imbalance, it makes it even more difficult to pull out of that. If we fail to take the Senate again, uh, I, I don't know if people remember this, but in the week leading up to the 2016 election, when it looked like Hillary Clinton was for sure going to win, as everybody knew she was, um, people like Ted Cruz and even John McCain were openly talking about shrinking the size of the Supreme Court. They were saying, there's nothing, there's nothing um, so significant about nine justices on the Supreme Court. We can have eight. They were openly talking about that. I think in the event that... Um, there is a Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, in 2021, and a Democratic president, they're not getting a Supreme Court justice. Um, they've signaled that already. Um, so that, that, that packing has occurred. It's going to be harder to undo it um, going forward. Uh, but also, in packing the courts, you've undermined the legitimacy of the courts. The courts need to be seen as this independent body that isn't poisoned by partisan um, partisanship, and that's not where we are anymore. And I think uh, the Republican Party for a long time has viewed the courts as uh, a political battlefield. That's been less true on the progressive side of the spectrum, although I think Kavanaugh has changed a lot of minds. Um, 
So these are the two problems you need to solve, and I think any set of policy reforms that we look at needs to do both. It can't be to the, to the How Democracies Die book, it can't just be tit for tat. It can't be, well, they pack the court, now we pack the court, and then they'll pay, pack the court later. That will then not solve the second problem. That will further undermine the institution. So I think we gotta get creative. We gotta figure out how do you do both. You can expand the court, but can you add term limits? Can you do rotating justices? There are a few different options out there that are being debated. I wouldn't say I've got the only idea out there, but I do think it's important for anybody running for president right now to describe exactly how they're gonna tackle this issue, because otherwise, what we very well could see happen is a bold pro-democracy package pass in 2021 and then a Roberts court just rule against it and um, throw out everything. Great. So, so let me ask one final question. I'm going to shift gears a little yeah. bit and then we'll open it up. Um, and I wanted to pick up some, on something that we talked a little bit at, about at lunch. Um, so you have worked uh, on the Hill. You've worked in policy advocacy. Um, and now you're the head of this organization whose strength lies in its ability to mobilize thousands of ordinary voters. So I'm, I'm just curious, particularly for the st undergraduate students in the audience, if you could just reflect a little bit on those sort of different modes of working for change and their sort of the, some of the trade-offs between those different arenas and their students out here trying to think about what they're gonna do for the rest of their lives and um, yeah. any thoughts there? Um, so I, we, we were talking about this earlier with the lunch with the students and I think y you, know, you can uh, occupy different spaces at different points in your career and I think that's totally fine. Um, I was on Capitol Hill and in advocacy, and I thought at that point, especially when there was a political opportunity to actually push through big things, that was the place to be. You could actually do a lot of good. It mattered who the staffers were. It mattered who was maneuvering inside the halls of Congress. That was important. By the time I left that space, I, I was becoming disillusioned with the ability to actually push for real change. Um, it seemed like we um, were not lacking in the number of white papers that were out there, the number of like coalition builders in, inside DC, that that wasn't why we weren't solving poverty. Um, the reason why we weren't solving poverty was because political will wasn't there. I think right now the single best thing we can do is build up political power in this country. The missing piece right now in the country is political power. Um, so that means organizing and that means getting behind the leaders you want to see actually in office. So for anybody who has just graduated, I would, I would pick a candidate or pick an organization that's building power and get behind them and help them um, build that power. Um, that could change in 2021 if we're successful. Maybe there's going to be an opportunity to, to push on the inside. That doesn't mean that that outside game isn't going to be important. The way we get that done is going to be by building up that outside power. But um, I, I see there as being at different times, different places where you can have the most impact. Great. Thanks. So we're going to open it up now. Um, and the system is, uh, there are some mics going around. Uh, I'm going to call on people, so if you want to ask a question, raise your hands. I'm going to try to call on two people at once so you can each get a mic ready, um, and, and we'll take as many questions as we can. Um, so I see one up there in the back. Can we get a mic here? Anybody else ready? And one right here in the front, center front. Great, so up in the back first. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I just had a question. So you, you predicate a lot of your, I would say, your policies that you want to see or a lot of your, your political views off of the idea that, you know, the U.S. should be this, this big, beautiful constitutional democracy. But, like, if you kind of look at the history of the foundation and our institutions, it's more reflective of a constitutional republic that has democratic institutions. So... I know that's like a lot of issues when it's coming to expanding democratic institutions. So how would you, I mean, I, it would probably need a constitutional amendment, but how would you change some of those more constitutional republicanism uh, institutions and then replace them with democratic institutions? Yeah, so I mean, my, my uh, issue with the, the functioning of democracy now is actually that it's not representative. So it's not acting as a functional republic right now. We have incredibly popular legislation that literally can't get a vote in the Senate because we have these institutions that don't actually reflect the will of the people. If, uh, if the Congress was able to actually reflect that popular will, we would have many of the things we want. So all of the reforms we're talking about here are reforms that try to make our democratic institutions more responsive, more reflective more representative of the broader American public. And what we see on the other side is this recognition that the country, like I said, is getting more diverse, is getting more unequal. And there's an effort to 
prevent our democratic institutions from responding to that changing electorate. I just want everybody to be represented. So we're here, and then in the SU shirt over here. Thank you for coming. Um, so um, as, a local, ooh, as a local organizer, I sometimes find it very difficult to work with lawmakers on the other side. Usually local lawmakers, they sometimes don't respond very well to criticism. Um, I often have this internal debate about whether to hold them accountable publicly or to withhold from doing that right away to maintain this relationship with them and hope that they'll want to meet again. Um, what do you find is the best way to approach lawmakers who um, are clearly uh, contributing to that threat of democracy and just aren't open to having conversations? Yeah, so, you know, I think the, um, you know, it depends on what space you oc occupy within the advocacy world that you're in. It could be that you're purely playing the inside game, and a lot of organizations do that. They don't really have as much of a grassroots presence, but they have really good policy advocates, they have really good experts, and what they specialize in, in is building this relationship with the lawmakers directly. So to break with them publicly would be a big deal. It would be giving up um, the, uh, the one asset they have, which is this connection to the lawmakers themselves. That's not the role that Indivisible plays, and in fact, we really caution people away from being captured by the lawmakers, whether it's, you know, it doesn't matter what party you're in, independents, Republicans, Democrats, um, because uh, as we see it, the role for indivisible groups is to exist outside the party structure. Our goal is not to develop friendships with lawmakers. It's not to get the cell phone numbers of a senator or representative. That's nice. It's nice to see our names in print, but the goal is to actually change policy. And the way you do that is by uh, providing positive and negative feedback. So when they do something good, you cheer, and when they do something bad, um, you boo. Uh, and you get media, and you make clear that they're representing or not representing their constituents. Um, that's not what everybody within the advocacy world is gonna do, that is what Indivisible does. We affirmatively try to stay outside the party structure and not directly tied to you know, some specific ally in Washington or in the State House. Yep. Hi. Hey. Hello, hello, hi. Uh, thank you for coming. I, I am like, I'm fascinated by this idea of um, this uh, representation in a government that's supposed to represent everybody, while at the same time like not representing key people who we need to hear from. Um, and like in these last midterms, we've seen like the most diverse representation of women and um, people, people of color in both in the government and uh, statewide and federal wide. And so uh, I, I guess like we know that the house is on fire as far as like democracy is concerned and getting that representation, but what policies have like in, in, like in your line of view, in your work, have we seen that are very effective and also like not effective into getting like that representation in there. I'm not sure if I'm clear enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, and we dive into this into the book, pre-order. Um, and right. the, uh, so that, that is the, the question that we try to tackle. And there, there was a good piece of legislation that went through the House of Representatives earlier this year called the For the People Act. I think it's a good baseline. Um, and it does a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, it provides for election security. It provides small dollar matches to tackle campaign finance. It ensures that there is fair redistricting that is done, independent uh, redistricting commissions. It ensures uh, early voting, same day voting, uh, automatic voter registration, all good things. Um, I think there, that's all good and that's also a baseline. So we need to build on top of that. Um, so that's why when we go into the book, I think we need to enfranchise Americans who are currently not enfranchised. That means folks in DC, that means folks in Puerto Rico, that means immigrants, that means young people, that means incarcerated and formerly incarcerated folks. We need to uh, ensure that our elections are easy to participate in, hard to steal. Um, that should be a bottom line. And I do think that we, we saw an incredible new class get elected to the House of Representatives last term and I'm proud of um, so many indivisible groups that rallied around members um, to be part of that blue wave that was built. It is worth noting that in the entire country, there was precisely one black Republican elected to Congress um, in literally the entire country. Uh, he's not running for re-election. Um, so we did see a very diverse class, uh, class, it was very lopsided. And I think part of the reason for that is because we are actively disenfranchising such a large swath of the country. So we'll go with that woman in the black vest right here. And then um, Bond, who's right next to her, can go next. Hi, I have two questions. Um, one of them is, where in Texas are you from? Mm. Um, Buda, Texas is where I grew up. Um, I know, thriving metropolis. Uh, mm -hmm. It's between Austin and San Antonio. It used to be the boonies. Um, now, it, I actually grew up outside Buda city limits, if you can imagine. Um, uh, and now it's practically a suburb of Austin because Austin's just expanded so much. 
Okay, yeah. sorry. I, just... I, yeah, I grew up, I was homeschooled in this small little town. All of my family members are in the music business. My dad is there, my sister's got in the music business. I had zero talent, which is why I'm here. <laughs> Sorry, just curious. Um, my other question on a more serious note, you keep saying that uh, if we say lose the 2021 election, then we're, we're screwed, there is no coming back. So if we lose the 21, 2021 election, uh, will this be disbanded? This being America? No, indivisible. <laughs> uh, so there's nothing, uh, uh, at the heart of Indivisible, the idea is that in a representative democracy, your representatives ought to represent you. And in order to ensure that, you need to participate in democracy. That basic idea is true regardless of if there are Republicans or Green Party members or Libertarians in charge. Um, that, that, that is true. Um, now, I think in the event that you lose the 2020 election, and by lose I mean either Donald Trump gets reelected or Mitch McConnell remains Senate Majority Leader in 2021, the, the prospects for the kinds of democracy reform I'm talking about are basically nil. They're not going to happen um, because the Republicans are going to block it from happening. So then you've got to ask yourself, what good can you do um, going forward? And I think the answer is if you elect um, somebody other than Donald Trump president, you could look at administrative reforms, uh, which is going to be much more limited and uh, less permanent. Um, and you can look at state level policy advocacy, which of course is going to be limited primarily to the states where you um, have the political power necessary to push it through, but it's not gonna be in many of the states that are um, withstanding a lot of the attacks from this administration from the state legislature. So it's, it's bad, it is really bad. The, the problems that we're facing in 2021 are severe and it is not an option to just you know, try to fight the best we can in 2021. We do have to win in 2020. That is a necessary first step to the kind of reforms we need to see. Next to you, actually. Yeah, right here. Thanks. Thanks. So, I hope like, people can hear me. Um, so we were talking about this earlier during the luncheon, yeah. but I also would like to expand on the idea of if we do win a supermajority or even a majority, there will be obviously a very large pushback from the other side. Yeah. How exactly do you think your movement will anticipate this and react to hopefully get um, the measures that you want pushed through, considering that they will be up against a hard resistance? It's a great question. This is, I, again, why we wrote the book. <laughs> Y'all are, are the best. Uh, um, so the, uh, uh, the point in part of, of focusing in on the book and, and elsewhere on this um, two-year strategy is to point out exactly that that if we treat this whole movement as the point is, we just need to get rid of Trump and then we're done and we go home, we're gonna fail. And the thing that really um, sticks out in my mind, um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but just for everybody else, um, I think about uh, 1977 and when Carter came into office. Carter came in, had a super majority in the Senate, had a, a huge majority in the House. Um, obviously this is after Watergate, this is after Agnew is driven from office, after Nixon is driven in office, it was the, uh, the, the Trump before Trump, uh, and we had this political opportunity in that moment. Um, there was demand for political change, and in fact, one of Carter's first major proposals in early 1977 was this massive democracy proposal. It was really um, a huge deal. It uh, would have eliminated, eliminated the Electoral College, it would have provided for election security, it would have provided um, campaign finance reform. It was really a bold package of democracy reforms in this post-Nixon era. And after having won such huge majorities in the House and the Senate. And ultimately, that package got filibustered. It didn't even get a vote in the Senate. It died. There was no movement that rose up to support it. And the existing people who had won office won it under the existing rules, and so they didn't want to change the rules. So it died. Um, I think about one of the lost opportunities of the Obama era was this huge grassroots force that was built up in order to elect Barack Obama in 2008, turned into Obama for America, Organizing for America, and what happened to it? It was largely absorbed within the existing Democratic Party and it wasn't used to support the president's policies. And instead of having a massive progressive grassroots force in support of the Affordable Care Act, in support of the stimulus, in support of Dodd-Frank or uh, labor reforms or climate or immigration, instead we got the Tea Party and there was no countervailing force. So I think you are exactly right. If we are successful in 2020, we are going to see something like the Tea Party in 2021, a new version of that. And there is a big question of, do we have some other force out there that's going to stand up for the reforms that we're fighting for? In the absence of that, I think we'll lose. So one nightmare scenario is we just lose in 2020. We fail to win the elections. But another nightmare scenario is we fail to actually align this broader grassroots movement that has been resisting Trump around fighting for democracy in 2021 
We need people to treat that 2020 election again as a milestone, not the finish line. The finish line is actually saving American democracy. And that's going to take a little bit longer. I just want to remind everyone that um, we're live streaming and recording the event, so it is helpful if you hold the mic as close to your mouth to make sure it's as loud as you can. And um, we're going to go right here in the front and then the woman with the vote shirt right here. Thank you for coming up. Oh, <laughs> I guess it's on now, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Fred Ringwald, leader of We the People of Oswego Indivisible. Yeah. I appreciate you coming. Uh, I appreciate you saying earlier that uh, the election of Donald Trump was not the cause. It was a symptom of what's happening, the fracture of our society. And if we mean? achieve the uh, improvements that we're proposing here, we're still going to have a divided society that needs to be healed. And part of that is restoring rule of law, restoring respect for the media, restoring respect for the truth, yeah. res uh, restoring respect for values that most people claim to uh, embrace. And I'm asking, I don't know this is a, for a simple, small question, yeah. if you could uh, address how this effort you're describing would achieve those goals. How do, you, how do we heal the country? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, super easy. Mm -hmm. So I do, think, uh, uh, I do think a prerequisite for that is treating the residents of this country as, as full-fledged residents of this country that deserve representation like everybody else. I think we can't start that healing process without acknowledging the disenfranchisement um, and the, the, um, the concentration of power that, that predominantly uh, white wealthy men have pursued for the last several decades. I don't think we can heal until we acknowledge the damage that's been done and right that. That's got to be part of the healing process. Now, a lot of the reforms we're talking about will fix the structural problems, um, uh, some of the structural problems of democracy, but it's not the end of it. You're right. You're, you're absolutely right. So um, I think it is a prerequisite, but we don't have a solution to solving all the cultural problems in America. That's the second book. Um, so. <laughs> I would recommend stay with us, and we'll, we'll just, it's something that we're going to have to grapple with together. So right here, yes. Um, so I worked in local organizing during 2018 and the blue wave, and I was faced with a lot of apathy from people my age. Um, and I, I'm wondering what you think is the best way to energize youth who are generally apathetic to politics or just feel rejected by our political system. So I think this is not even specific to youth, but any population. I think there, uh, and we, nobody's brought up um, uh, the demographics of indivisible groups, but we should talk about it. Demo uh, demographically, indivisibles tend to be uh, white, college-educated women, which is to say not the uh, entirety of the progressive movement and not everything we need in order to win. Um, they also tend to be either, I see two age humps normally, and depends based on where we are, but either um, younger mothers or retirees, um, but not a ton of um, uh, folks in high school, not as many college chapters um, as there are folks in those age ranges. Um, and one reaction to coming into a room of disproportionately privileged white women is to say, well, how do, we, how do we get young people? How do we get people of color? How do we make sure that this group is more diverse? And I actually think that is the wrong question. The question should be, how do we actually effectively fight for justice? And if you are showing up for issues that people care about, then you are going to diversify your group. So I see the, the work that the Sunrise Movement is doing as great. If that's, if that's um, an issue that is going to attract more young people to the fight, by all means, organize on this. But if you're not showing up for immigrants when they're under attack, if you're not showing up for communities of color when they're under attack, if you're not showing up for the issues that young people care about, why on earth would you expect them to be part of your coalition? Um, this is one of the things we think is absolutely necessary for winning in 2020. We can't expect populations that are ignored by the political system to show up just because the other side is so scary. We've got to actually fight for the issues they care about. Um, Indivisible is going to be the right avenue, the right vehicle to organize some of the country. It's not going to be the right uh, vehicle to organize all of the country. So sometimes we are, we are organizing these constituencies, but sometimes we're trying to act as effective allies and co-conspirators with these other groups. Um, so I, I do think, but bo bottom line, we need to be showing up for the issues that people care about in order to energize them. Um, we're going to go to Jonah right here and then Professor Campbell in the back. Zane, right here. Jonah, raise your hand. Hey, uh, hey good to see you. We, we had an email exchange in, what, two days after the guide came out? Right. Yeah. yeah. And I was having, yeah, you came to some of our calls right away. Yeah. 
Um, well, good to meet you in person. Yeah. Um, first, I just want to acknowledge that we're in an important congressional swing district and thank, you know, Dana Balter, who's a congressional candidate, for being here. Indivisible and Doris, too. Um, my question is, as part of the democracy reforms, um, I think getting big money out of politics and overturning Citizens United is absolutely essential. And we can't do that without, I guess, a new Supreme Court or a constitutional amendment. Correct. Uh, but how do we build for a constitutional amendment in a country where Republicans really are just steadfastly against democracy, against democracy? Uh, great question. So I think there are, you're absolutely right. There's some partial steps we can take on campaign finance reform. There, some of them are included in HR1. One of the ideas is uh, matching small dollar contributions six to one. So every dollar under, I think it's $250 that you contribute would be matched by six, um, which is a way to try to balance a little bit more, but it doesn't undo Citizens United. And to your point, yes, you need to change the Supreme Court or you need to pass a constitutional amendment. Um, and that, that's a longer term goal. So I think it is possible for us to have goals that are on different time horizons. Right now, the existential threat that we're trying to address is what, what can we uh, solve in 2021 immediately? So we have this vision of having the House of Senate and the presidency in January 2021. What, what is the first piece of legislation that goes through? And unfortunately, it's not going to be us passing a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. We're not gonna get that done in 2021. It is something we can build towards, and the democracy reforms that we're talking about would help us do that. I would say that there is broad bipartisan support for the kinds of reforms that we're talking about here. This does not need to be a Democratic versus Republican issue. In, 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 uh, in general, if, as long as you exclude congressional Republican elites, if you talk to just Republicans on the street, they don't think Congress works either. They don't like money in politics either. So there is some opportunity to do this, but I think it's a longer term vision. This is why we, the, the book is in many ways very tactical, that we're trying to say, okay, we've got a, a limited window of opportunity. What can we get done in that limited window? Not the end, not the end of what we want to accomplish, um, but what, what can we do immediately? And then we need to build on it. So we've got Professor Campbell and then the young man in the baseball cap in the middle. I want to thank individuals for the work that they've done to pose those ice raids across the country. Because this, um, as some of you know, is really been an attack on immigrant communities across yes. this country. And the work of your members is commendable. But what I find striking about your presentation is what you've left out in relationship to the objective conditions of the country. The role of private equity in politics. Yeah. And individual has not taken a position on private equity at home and abroad in relationship to militarism and the role of what you consider to be past democracy. Because the objective conditions of the democracy that you talked about has changed. But my question to you is about this thing I've heard on the news, where there has been someone who used the word civil war. And the first, the quest, first part of my question is, do you dismiss this? talk by the President of the United States. And the second part of my question, if you do not dismiss it, what is the planning of invisible for such an eventuality? Also easy question. <laughs> um, so we just uh, l let me note on the ice raids quick, but then I'll go into uh, uh, the other two things would be concentration of economic wealth and the impact on the political system, um, which is private equity and broader. Um, and then this threat of a civil war. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. So on, I, I would say some of the, the proudest moments I've had at Indivisible is when we've been standing up with the immigrant rights groups across the country um, in opposition to Trump's policies. What we know about Trumpism is really at the core of it is this anti-immigrant xenophobia. And it's been that from the beginning. In 2015, Trump launched his campaign talking about the folks coming out over the borders who were criminals and drug dealers. In 2016, he ran his campaign on this. In 2017, his first policies were the Muslim ban, um, were attacks on immigrant communities and attempt to build the wall. In 2018, while trying to save um, uh, his congressional majority, he was running on this 
trumped up idea of this caravan invading the country. Uh, and we know headed into 2020, immigration is going to be at the heart of the campaign he runs. So we don't have a choice about whether to fight with immigrants or not if you're trying to resist Trump. You got to. Um, we have to stand with him because this is core to Trumpism, and we believe that strongly. So we, we have formed very strong partnerships with the immigrant rights community in order to fight um, uh, arm in arm with them as these attacks come. And the major legislative attack this year is indeed a fight over whether to provide funding to Trump's deportation machine or not. Um, there was a continuing resolution, a short-term budget to provide funding through um, uh, early to mid-November, and there's a question of whether Democrats will draw the line or not. And I think what, uh, what we have been trying to build up, and in fact the local indivisible groups uh, here have been active in as well, is trying to ensure that Democratic members of Congress stand with the immigrant communities and not with Trump. Um, just a note on that. Um, the second question, which is broadly about the, the effect of concentration of wealth on our political system and how, you, um, how, how can you have a functioning democracy when the levels of wealth inequality are such as they are. There was a recent article in the New York Times, um, this isn't just about private equity, but there was a recent article in the New York Times that uh, it was a new analysis by is it Emmanuel Says and a couple, somebody else um, looking at the change in tax rates for the top uh, 400 Americans, the richest 400 Americans over the course of the last several decades. And just now, as a result of the tax bill that was passed, uh, it is now the case that for the first time since they were tracking this uh, for the last several decades, the top 400 Americans pay a uh, uh, less as a percentage of their income in taxes than the poorest uh, Americans. That's a result of policy change. And so, there is a little bit of a chicken or egg problem here. We have a democracy that is infected by concentrated wealth, and also um, it's not representative. Um, so how do, you, uh, how do you change the concentration of wealth when you don't have a representative democracy? Uh, we think that in order to pass the kind of tax bills, in order to pass the kind of social and economic policies we would need um, to do things like break up Facebook, break up Google, to tax people their fair share, you need a representative democracy that responds to the people, and that's what we would hope these democracy reforms um, actually, uh, actually realize, that you have the broader population being represented so that you can do things like raise taxes on billionaires, as many people and, for instance, the Democratic primary for president are proposing. Um, third thing, civil war. I don't think we can um, just dismiss things that the president says. Um, I think there's been um, uh, years of examples of people saying, oh, that's just him talking. We don't really need to pay attention to it. He's just kidding. Um, uh, he's speaking figuratively, when in fact he's told us who he is from the beginning. He's told us his plans from the beginning, and I think we need to listen to him. I, for one, am very worried that, uh, w that Democrats will win in 2020, that on November 3rd there will be a clear decision, uh, and that Donald Trump will be voted out of office, and I'm not confident he will peacefully step down. I don't think that's a guarantee. So I think we need to be prepared. And part of that is having the grassroots energy that comes out on November 4th and says, no, you lost. Now it's time for peaceful transfer of power. But the other thing we really need are Republican officials who will also do that same thing. We need people in his party saying, no, you lost. Now it's time to give up power. Because if it is the Republican Party versus everybody else, I do think you're going to have some conflict that doesn't look pretty. Um, and we can't afford that. So Professor Rear has just signaled me that we have time for two more questions, and I have at least four or five hands in the queue. We could do rapid. So, uh, to, so I'm going to try. Yeah. I'm going to try to take several in a row. He said two, but I'm going to try to take three or four. If you guys are concise, and then, and then, and there is a reception oh, right. coming. But then I'm going to make Ezra answer them all at once. Is Great. what we're going to do. So first is baseball cap, and then those folks right in the back row, and then red scarf right here. <laughs> Can you hold it closer to your head? Yeah. Yeah, um. no, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'll, I'll say it again. Uh, do you think the DNC is complicit in this democratic erosion? And, and if so, how much do you think this um, uh, inaccess or I guess inability or uh, I guess decline of representation, how much do you, do you attrib that, uh, attribute, uh, attribute that to uh, external factors that influence how lawmakers act. So yeah, as far great, as, great. Like, special Got it. interest. Okay, and Got then it. up in the back row. 
I can hear you. I don't know if it's okay. on. Okay. <laughs> My question is about living in a blue state. We live in a blue state, and I think many of us are very actively involved, but many of us also feel like we can vote, but we can't impact the votes in 49 other states. Yeah. And, um, you know, as you pointed out, it's all in the changes that would happen in the laws if we get the right kind of representation in 2020. But, you know, the best we can do in our city yeah. is turn over District 24 and hold on to what we already have, which is, that feels a little bit poor. So help us with that. Yep, got it. Please stay. I'd like it if you would speak about the Electoral College because a lot of voters yep. I speak to are extremely um, disenheart just discouraged and yep. apathetic. And then right here. I love everything that you've been saying, but what are we going to do? How do you do all of this when you know that there are actors on the other side that will not play fair, yeah. that will do yeah. whatever they have to do, that will hurt people, hurt laws, do everything wrong? How do yeah. you fight that? Yeah. Okay, so try to do rapid, which means this is going to take a while. But um, so what role do Democratic politicians have in this breakdown of democracy? And so what, what I would say is that um, every single elected official in office right now got elected according to the rules um, that we currently have. And we know that power concedes nothing without a demand. So that holds whether you are an independent, a Republican, or a Democrat. Now, I, I, we, we've gone over the precise attacks on democracy coming from these reactionary elites. Um, I think that is real. I don't think that if we just elect Democrats, all of our problems are solved. I think in 2021, if we have uh, Democrats in control of the House to Senate and the presidency, you're still going to need pressure in order to convince Democrats who are elected that, yeah, you were elected according to these campaign finance rules or these election security rules or these uh, uh, constituencies who are enfranchised rules. But in fact, we need to change that, and we are going to put pressure on you to change that. And I think that's necessary. You can't just win an election and assume everything's going to work itself out. Um, uh, questions about uh, what to do in a blue state. Um, so this is a question we've got from the very, very beginning. Um, the three, three answers. One, you, you do live in a blue state, kind of. Um, you have uh, some representatives who are good and some representatives who could use some nudging um, and some representatives who could be changed. And so what I would say is, um, one, positive reinforcement is very rare. So if you have good representatives you really think of as being good, um, most of the time when people get in touch with their state legislator or with their member of Congress, they're getting in touch because they're pissed off. That's just human nature. You're angry about something, you call, you yell about it. It's more rare to receive calls from people who are very happy that you're fighting the good fight, that you're out there in front, that you're really leading on an issue. That kind of positive reinforcement is really important. That applies to your representative, it applies to Chuck Schumer, it applies to, to everybody. Let them know when they're doing good, let them know when they're not doing good, let them know that you are watching. That is really, really important, even if, they, even if you think of them as being on your side. Um, but, uh, so let's say you've done that. You've, you've done everything you can to elect your friends who you think are going to be on your side. Um, you provide the positive reinforcement and you provide the nudges when they don't do good. Um, there, is way, there are ways to use uh, your maybe call it excess energy to help out other indivisibles in other parts of the country. A good example of this right now um, is a tool that Indivisible National has out right now on impeachment and it's that, called the Hub Dialer tool. We do not recommend that you call Kevin McCarthy's district because you're not represented by Kevin McCarthy. We don't recommend you call uh, Martha McSally in Arizona or Journey Ernst in Iowa or Susan Collins in, in Maine. They don't care what you think. They don't represent you. That's not even a knock on them. That's just how representative democracy works in this country. But we have a tool that allows you to call other pro-impeachment folks in those states and tell them, hey, you've got power right now. I'm not represented by these senators, but you are. Now, if you'll let me, I'm going to press a button and you're going to be connected directly to their office. We're going to drive over a million calls to these uh, Senate offices over the course of the next few weeks. And you can do that right now in your indivisible group, in your blue state. But still, I would encourage you to focus on your own electives to begin with. After you've done that, you can use that excess energy to help out other indivisibles. Electoral college, let's get rid of it. Love it. <laughs> um, that said, that's not a solution for 2020. It's not going to happen. It's the same problem that faces us on the constitutional amendment. In order to eliminate the Electoral College, you either need a constitutional amendment or the more popular version that is moving through now is an interstate compact where you get enough states at the state legislature level to pass a law saying 
if enough states pass this law, and if somebody wins the popular vote, all of our electoral votes go to the winner of the popular vote. Great idea. You're also going to need some red states to do it. We're not close to doing that yet. Um, so I'm all for eliminating the Electoral College. I'm all for fighting this fight at the state level, if you have the ability to do it. But let's not kid ourselves. This is not going to solve our problem in 2020. Um, we need, and, and it's not going to be the thing we get done in 2021 in all likelihood. So yes, long-term plan, but not the solution to, to everything. Um, uh, and then- not gonna play fair. Uh, right, so the other side's not gonna play completely fair. We know that already. Um, uh, they've not been playing fair for the last two years. Why would they start now? Um, there, there are a limited set of things we can do, but we need to run up the score so it's hard to steal. Uh, it is easier to steal an election that is separated by 0.1% than it is that's separated by 2%. Just as simple as that. Um, what we saw in Georgia was that the, um, the, the Secretary of State who was running for governor had control of the voter rolls and was able to purge hundreds of thousands of votes. Stacey Abrams did an incredible job running and um, very well may have won that election and it was stolen from her. Uh, now, we can't allow that to happen. That means we need more people voting for us. That means, uh, that doesn't just mean a big get out the vote effort though. And I think there is this common misconception that the way you win elections is everybody ramps up and you know, registers a lot of voters in the summer and then gets out the vote in, in the fall um, and that's how we're gonna win. But that, that's not what we've seen within Indivisible. Yes, that's important. We ought to be doing that. But keep in mind the best get out the vote effort pushes the envelope by two, maybe three percentage points at best. That's gold standard. That's relational organizing tools. That's knocking on all doors. In reality, you're probably gonna push a percentage point or two. Um, that's it. But what we know from new research coming out is that there's a big impact from off your organizing uh, on election year outcomes. So if you are showing up in support of immigrants in 2019, if you're showing up in opposition to the budget bill that's coming out, if you're showing up in favor of impeachment right now, you're building the movement and you're also changing the political environment. That's how we wound up in 2018 with just a ton of Republican retirements. That's how we wound up with the kind of movement we needed to build a blue wave in 2018. So I would say the way we are going to win in 2020 is we gotta run up the score and the way we do that is by getting involved right now. So I hate to cut off the conversation when there are still questions. I encourage folks to follow us back to the Maxwell foyer um, for the reception, or maybe you can- just, I, wanna, I wanna thank yep. both Tom yep. and Ezra for yep. an insightful yep. and provocative yep. conversation. Yep. And please do, please do join us across the way in Eggers Hall for a reception where we can continue what we've started here. Thank you.